Hey everybody, Father Warner here. We are in Friday of the 10th week in Ordinary Time and our text is from 1 Kings chapter 19. We do verses 9 and then 11 to 16. But I recommend very strongly that you please read the entire chapter 19 from verse 1 to 16 and then tomorrow we carry on uh, with a very, very interesting text. Now, uh, straight away, just to help you go through this text, you see, in chapters 17 and 18, you see a very powerful prophet, Elijah. And Elijah has worked about seven miracles in chapter 17 and 18. He has defeated the gods of Baal. Um, he has put the prophets and the priests of Baal, 450 of each of those gods, uh, uh, to death. And then he, after having scored a victory of sorts, we are told that um, there is the sign of rain. After three, three and a half years of drought, uh, he sees that little fist, a cloud no bigger than his fist, and he tells Ahab, this cruel king, this king who has apostatized, this king who has turned away from God, he tells him, go, go back quickly, get into your chariot, and we know that uh, for some reason, Elijah runs ahead of the chariot to Jezreel. This is uh, where Jezebel is. Now, the text of today really takes off because Ahab comes to Jezreel and he tells uh, Jezebel what's happened. Look, she was a Sidonian princess. Uh, this was Baal were her gods. These were the prophets uh, that and the priests that she would have supported from the royal treasury. And I'm sure Jezebel must have seen the rain coming. She must have thought, well, my god Baal has delivered for me. Baal was the god of the rain, of, of weather, of fertility. And then her husband Ahab comes home and says, well, I have bad news and I have terrible news. The bad news is Yahweh won the battle and all your prophets and priests have been slaughtered by Elijah. And the text of today, chapter 19, begins with a note, a messenger, that Jezebel sends Elijah. And she says, what you've done to my prophets, I'm going to do to you in the next 24 hours. And you can see that Elijah is terrified because he is now going to be put to death. Um, it's very interesting to see that, you know, Elijah is afraid because he's looking at that note sent from the messenger. His eye is no longer on the Lord, the Lord who worked mighty miracles through him. His eye is now on that note, not on the Lord, and fear sets in. When our eyes are not on God, fear begins to set in. Now, Elijah, we are told, runs away. He runs away first to Beersheba, which is really way down south in uh, the southern kingdom. It is in the valley of the Negeb. He goes into the desert and there he literally throws a fit. He tells the Lord, he gets under a bloom tree. It's more a shrub than a tree and he tells the Lord, I've had it. Now please take my life. I mean, I'm as good as my dead ancestors. Jezebel is after me, so take my life. Uh, you know, it's a good thing that God doesn't always answer our silly prayers. I'm sure there are many times we prayed for something that we thought was extremely good for us, but it's not good for God. And thank God, God didn't listen to Elijah's prayer and says, okay, you want to die? Let's put you to death. No, God doesn't do that. The first thing that God does is he's, he's, he's compassionate. Remember that chapter 17 and 18 has seen, um, you know, Elijah battle the God's um, the god Baal battle his prophets, a long run from uh, Mount Carmel all the way to Jezreel. He is really exhausted and very often prophets, priests, you and I who serve the Lord, when we are exhausted, we need to rest. And God recognizes that even though this great prophet is depressed spiritually, and he was a terribly depressed prophet at this point in time, depressed enough to say, I want to die, God recognizes that the first thing he needs to do is to nourish Elijah. He recognizes, and, and I want to say this, you know, when you are tired, 
please rest. I know I'm on sabbatical for two years. I don't know what people expect me. Some think I should be confined to a bed because I, I don't need to be confined to a bed. I need mental rest. Yeah, A lot of our priests are stressed. I cannot tell you dealing with government, dealing with income tax, dealing with accountants, dealing with school, dealing with education ministry, dealing with 5,000 parishioners, 10% who can be terribly irrational. The pressure on the priests, and, and this is what happens. Many priests simply, you know, break down. They stop functioning. You can see them as a young priest as enthusiastic, full of life, and then they just break down very often. And this is a fact that the bishops today are not in touch with their priests. Yeah, Pope Francis spoke of airport bishops. I can think of several of them who are never in their diocese and never available to their priests without that support from your bishop. Yeah, a priest can fall apart. Now, Elijah was falling apart. What does God do? He doesn't condemn him. He feeds him. He sends an angel and it's so beautiful. Get up and eat, the angel says. And he gets room service. He gets a hot meal. Yeah, there are hot, you know, there are hot stones and a cake baked on it and a jar of water. No longer God is saving, sending him ravens or, you know, a woman who is living in the land of famine. He got, gets a hot meal. And not once, twice. God allows him to rest. But then God says, I cannot allow you to get into depression. I've got a, I've, I need you to move on. So Elijah, we are told, moves from Beersheba and he continues to flee uh, even further down south and he goes to the Mount of the Lord, Horeb. Mount Horeb is the same place where Moses was given the Ten Commandments, Mount Sinai. And here we, he finds refuge in a cave. Now, twice God is going to, uh, you know, go up to him and uh, call Elijah into question. And that question is such a lovely one. What are you doing here? What are you doing here? In short, God is saying, you're not supposed to be here. Yeah. You know, wherever we sin, wherever we get into a sin, sin situation, hear the voice of God saying, what are you doing here? Yeah, you're watching pornography. God is saying, what are you doing here? Yeah. You're doing something that you ought to do, ought not to do. Hear the voice of God saying, what are you doing here? Because this is not where you belong. So, God says, what are you doing here? Well, Elijah ought to have said, Lord, I'm running away from you. Lord, I'm tired. Lord, I'm... But no, Elijah begins to deflect. He begins to justify his position. And look what he says. In fact, what he says is not even factual. He says, I've been very zealous for the Lord. That is true. The God of hosts. For the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. Uh, well, quite recently, we know that the Israelites also turned back to Yahweh and killed the prophets of Baal. And then he says, I alone am left and they are seeking my life. He was not the only one. You know, towards the end of this text in verse 18, in chapter 19, verse 18, God says, yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel. I will not slaughter them. All those knees that have not bowed to Baal. So besides um, Elijah, who was faithful, there were 7,000 Israelites who were faithful. Uh, there were priests of, the, of Israelites who were faithful hidden in a cave. So instead of really addressing his problem, Elijah starts justifying his position. And that's what we always do with God. Instead of saying, I am in a sin situation, we justify our sin. Now, the text then comes to the verses of today. Uh, God tells him, go stand out. Because I'm going to appear to you. I'm, you're going to, you're, I'm going to encounter you. And we know that at first, there is a mighty wind, then there's an earthquake, then there is a fire, and then there's sheer silence. God, we are told, was not in the mighty wind. He was not in the earthquake, he was not in the fire. And many of us expect a God of this nature. You know, this God that appears to us in mighty ways, great miracles, great signs. Look at how many of us run to healing sessions, more because we are expecting, you know, that kind of mighty healing. And God works in silent ways. He was not in the wind. He was not in the earthquake. He's not in the fire. God was in silence. And when Elijah heard it, heard the silence, heard God whispering his name, not even shouting it loud, he wrapped his face in his mantle and he went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. You know, I think Elijah wrapped his face for two reasons. One is 
Well, they could not see the face of God. Yeah, Moses and Elijah did see God, but on the Mount of Transfiguration, they were with Jesus. But at this point of time, Yahweh could not be seen. But maybe Elijah was so ashamed of what he had done that he had to cover his face with a mantle. He was ashamed of his failings and his sin. And God once again asked him, what are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing? This is not where you belong. You know, when you see someone depressed and giving into depression, losing their vocation, losing their ministry, losing their faith in the priests, in, in the work that they do in the parishes, and they've gone somewhere else, tell, tell them this line, what are you doing here? This is not where you belong. So God gives him a mission again. He says, I want you now to go through the wilderness to Damascus. And he sends him. He says, I want you to anoint Hazael, the king of, Ara of Aram. Now, Aram was Syria. God is now asking a Jewish, an Israelite prophet to anoint a non-Israelite prophet. Because this is the way God is going to punish his people. And you'll read more because... He says, you will also after that anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. He's the one who's going to take over Ahab. And then you shall also anoint Elisha as your successor in your place. Maybe in one way God was saying, I'm disappointed with you, Elijah. And so I give you the pink slip, you're dismissed. But I think now when I read this text quite differently, you know, I think of it as God always saying, somebody needs to take over you know I, I say this many of us may think that you know without us the system won't work I think very often the system is not working because of us because we cling on to post cling on to power cling on to position and I've seen this as a sin in the church among the clergy you know the desire the hankering over positions you know people are way past their age and they won't move on. Uh, you know, I <laughs> interestingly met a priest in Goa who, who said to me, he said, the bishop is not releasing me. You know, and ironically, when I spoke to somebody, they said, well, the bishop doesn't know how to release him because he's such a difficult man. Now, this hankering for power, this not creating successors, I remember Bishop Bosco Pena so fondly because he insisted, you know, he said youth ministry collapses when one priest goes and the next fellow comes and takes over. And everything is run because of one priest who has not created an animating team that can continue with the work. But very often we are working for our glory. We are not working for the Lord. I did this as a young priest. You know, I was so enamored by oh, all the things I did that I failed to see continuity we need to appoint successors we need to move on and please remember that God is in charge of his church so Elijah is told look you have to you have three tasks you have to appoint anoint the king of Syria you have to anoint a, a person in the place of Ahab and find your own and I'm giving you a letting you know who your successor is now we know from the second book of Kings that Elijah did go and um, uh, you'll hear that tomorrow too he will throw his mantle on Elisha but the other two things he failed to do and yet he is the greatest among the Israelite prophets so straight away you know prophets are not perfect people I mean he was a perfectly depressed prophet he's not the only one Jonah was depressed he also had hid under a shrub he also told the Lord you better kill me I just don't want to do this task Jeremiah got fed up with his job. He gave his resignation several times to the Lord. So we can see that there are prophets um, who are not always been success stories. And our lives don't always have to be success stories. Our lives, even though we are devout, devoted, devout Christians, can be lives that have streaks of failure. But the last word is not our failure. The last word is always the Lord. So may the Lord bless you. I hope you like this teaching. Share it with others. I notice that we get about 163 subscribers, new subscribers every week. And I think that we can make that better by, you know, sending these uh, videos. Because I, I, I do believe that somehow, even though I'm not perfect, 
God uses me and God uses you to spread his good news. So keep well everybody. I want to leave you with a blessing, the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. I'll see you again tomorrow. Um, by next week, by Wednesday of next week, if I'm not mistaken, we begin the second book of Kings. So don't forget, like this video, share it, leave your comments, and I'll see you again. And I noticed that many of you on Saturday skipped the teachings. Huh? Don't do that. Okay, I'll see you tomorrow. Bye.